Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your hosts, Ken Jakes and Julie Johnson. Hi, Julie. How are you? Very well. Thanks, Ken. Well, we have a very special guest in our studio today, and he is the longtime uh, executive director of SIPE, uh, John Sullivan. He uh, brings to SIP just a wonderful history. He was here before the beginning of SIP. He was over at the chamber. So we're very happy to have him in studio with us today. John, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. It's great to chat with you, John. And I wanted to sort of go right back to the beginning, even before your time at SIP, and sort of just talk about um, how you got interested in political science. Now you have a PhD in political science. How you got interested in that and economics and sort of how, how that all evolved to, to getting you to that point of, of going and doing a PhD. Well, my favorite quote is from John Lennon, the Beatle. And that is, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I got interested in political science because that was the subject in the 60s. And mm. that's when I was in, in undergrad and grad school. And John, where did you do your undergrad? at the University of Pittsburgh okay. and did my graduate work there as well. So I got very interested in political science, um, largely because of the Vietnam War, but I was very interested in international relations, and that's what took me into the subject. Was there anything growing up that uh, kind of drew you to international relations, or is it something you just kind of picked up as an interest in college? Or It was something I picked up as uh, due to the nature of the time. Due to the nature of the time in the, in the right. 1960s, mm -hmm. yeah. Very turbulent time in, very the, United, turbulent in, in the United, United States. States. Yeah, and we really haven't seen anything like that since, actually. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> what was the subject of your PhD? Actually, I studied British foreign policy. So I thought that would be a very interesting yeah. subject. So I looked at the role that Great Britain played in the period from the end of World War II until the time it joined the uh, European Union, and particularly focusing on the Suez Canal crisis and the overthrow of the, of the uh, Mossadegh regime in Iran. And Go ahead. And you worked in Los Angeles for a while. Was that before your PhD or after? It was during. Okay. I took some time off after I'd completed my comprehensives and went out to Los Angeles and got interested in the subject of minority business enterprise. So that's where the economics piece came in? That's the beginning of it, but also in research on my dissertation as well, because a lot of what motivated Great Britain and its role in the world, and particularly its concern over Iran and its concerns over Egypt, was economic. Of course. International economic policy. John, what part of California was that? Was that uh, in the uh, San Francisco area or Los oh, Angeles? No, Watts is in w Los Watts. Angeles. You're in Watts, okay. I was in Watts. Okay, in you tell Angeles us a little area. bit about that. Well, I got very interested in minority business enterprise because, again, I was, this is the era of the civil rights movement, and I met some people who were very involved in that, and they were explaining to me that for civil rights to really happen, it had to touch on the economic sphere as well. Just having the political empowerment was not enough. And there were actually um, people connected to Dr. King. Uh, and so I got very involved with that, and I thought, well, that would be interesting to do for a while. So I ended up working in a think tank in Los Angeles, in Watts, looking at ways to create economic incentives to rebuild the Watts and the L.A. Basin. And then how did that turn into, did you move to Washington after that? Did, and that's how well, you got I decided, in the chamber? actually, as a result of that experience, I decided you couldn't really make fundamental change unless you changed the overall system. It wasn't enough to create a few little incentives in Watts. You had to really create a bigger change. And so I thought, well, maybe I should work on a presidential campaign. And uh, uh, some friends of mine knew Hugh Scott, the Senate Minority Leader, uh, and he gave me a letter of introduction to President Ford, and I ended up working on the F President Ford campaign. And that's what led you to Washington. And that's what led me to Washington. He didn't win, so I needed a job. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what led you to the chamber? That's what led me to the chamber. <laughs> so let's walk through that. What was that like back in those days? What was the chamber like in those days? And what year was this, John, when you came to Washington? Uh, that would have been 19, late 1975. Late 1975. So election. that was still almost a decade before SIPE had started. Right. Yes. Yeah, so to walk us through what the chamber was like back in those days. And it's completely different, obviously, than it is today. Well, at that time, there was something called the Powell Memo. And this was a memo written by uh, Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell before he became a Supreme Court Justice. And he, the title of his memo is, Business and the Free Enterprise System Are in Trouble and the Hour is Late. And what he did was raise a concern that business needed to be much more involved in economics, in economic policy, 
looking at national policy and international policy. And out of his memo came a series of recommendations to restructure the chamber. And to uh, it did not have a full-time president at that point. And the first change they made was to bring in Dr. Richard Lesher, and he became the full-time president and chief executive officer of the chamber. And how lar large was the chamber at that point? And much smaller than it is yeah, now. Yeah, I imagine so. And it was much more focused towards small and medium enterprises in those days, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was focused on large companies. Yeah. But again, business did not, in the early 70s, mid-70s, business didn't have a large presence in Washington. It was really the Powell Memo, the nature of the times, uh, the economic turbulence that was occurring during the Carter administration that led the Chamber, the NAM, and other business associations to really ramp up and become a more visible presence in the city. So when you joined the Chamber, what was your first job there? What did you do? I worked in the Public Affairs Department oh. on business and economic education. Mm. The idea being that uh, a lot of people in the United States had very negative attitudes toward uh, business and the idea was to try to educate them give them exposure to what the business system is how jobs are created and to build public trust how easy was it to also get business to see the importance of being involved in uh, ex you know understanding and explaining policy and so on was that something that was a fairly easy sell for business at that time or was it something they weren't used to doing and you had to sort of uh, ex convince them that it was an important thing well, I didn't play a big role in that mm -hmm. part, but yes, it was, and that's what Dr. Lesher did, is he really convinced the American business leaders. He had a, a team of people, though, who understood uh, the importance of that, one of whom was a person that later became important for Sipe, Jay Van Andel, the head of the Amway Corporation, the founder of Amway. And uh, Mr. Van Andel became very significant in the response to the Powell Memo, the restructuring of the chamber, and increasing the role of business. Now, was he part of the chamber back then? Was he on the board? He the became chamber? a member of the board, yes. yes. Okay. And in terms of your role in public affairs, what did you find resonated the best in terms of um, uh, explaining to the public the importance of business and the value of business? At, at that time, what resonated the best? Entrepreneurship. It, right. You know, selling, you know, giving the idea that if you want to create a vibrant economy, it's going to be dependent on entrepreneurs. And for entrepreneurs to succeed, they have to have a business-friendly environment. And then you took that international. And then we went international. <laughs> now, did you start to get involved in the international aspect of the Chamber's work uh, before SIPE was created? Or were you doing that at the Chamber before oh, 1983? A little bit. Uh, the Chamber became much more active under Ambassador Michael Samuels who became very important. He was the one that came up with the idea for SITE. Okay. But Ambassador Samuels had been ambassador to Sierra Leone, had been at the Center for the, uh, Strategic and International Studies, and Dr. Lesher brought him to the chamber to be the head of the international department. And what, what year was that, John? Do you remember? That would have been in the early 70s. Early 70s. Okay. Yeah. So he'd been there for a while before SITE was started. Um, Mid-70s, I guess, yes. He'd been there for a couple of years, and he wrote a very influential article along with uh, another gentleman named Bill Douglas, who at that time was working for the AFL-CIO, on the need for uh, a role for the United States in supporting democratic development around so the world. was that kind of the seed that was planted that led to the creation it was one of, of the seeds of, of the ned and mm -hmm. and that so let's talk about that so we're, we're probably talking early 80s now because ned right. was created in 83 but obviously they were talking about it probably a couple of years before that how were those seeds planted what what was real what was the impetus that really led to the the building of of the ned the national endowment for democracy well the impetus came from a number of different places and they came together at just a special moment in time but it was the political party, uh, the Republican National Committee and the Democratic National Committee, were looking at the world and seeing the German political parties, the French political parties, and others beginning to play a large role internationally. And the American parties had no international presence. And so they felt that they needed to be And that's kind engaged. of the pushback against what the so Soviet expansionism is at the time. Yes, that was a big part of it. The FFL-CIO had had a a large international presence for a long time because they were very concerned about the way in which the Soviets and the Comintern, as it was known, were in, encroaching on and taking over labor movements around the world. And so they were pushing back against that. The chamber became involved because of Ambassador Samuels and his concern that, you know, the, the business community needed to be part of this. We needed to get the idea of free enterprise and the enterprise system uh, out there 
So tell us about the legislation that was passed in 83 that led to the creation of the NED, and then what did that mean for SIPE? Now, was SIPE around before the creation of the NED, or did that come afterwards? Uh, SIPE was born right at the same time. At the same time. As were the two party institutes, the Republican Institute and the, and the National Democratic IRI Institute. IRI and NDI. Right. The labor program had been around for a while, so it was already in existence. But this all came as a result of a speech that President Reagan made in 1982 to the members of parliament at Westminster, where he called for the creation of a mechanism to address this issue of building and supporting democratic development in different countries around the world. And you have to remember, at that time, we had seen the revolution of the Carnations in um, Portugal, the Battle of Franco in Spain, and the uh, fall of the Greek Junta. And in each one of those cases, it was the German Stiftungs, the equivalent of our uh, political party foundations in the United States, that really played the big role in keeping the Soviets from taking over Spain, Portugal, and Greece. And so the United States was looking at that and saying, look, we've got to have this mechanism. We need to be part of this effort to build democracy support democratic development in different countries. So who were the champions in Congress at the time that, that really pushed the legislation through? Well, Congressman Dante Fussell was the major champion. He was just a terrific guy. He was a congressman from Florida. At that time, he was chairman of the House International Operations Committee, subcommittee, later became chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And then on the Senate side, I would say Senator Charles Percy was really, Chuck Percy was really very, very significant. But there were a large number. Senator Orrin Hatch, was on the uh, study committee, and uh, as was Senator Chris Dodd. So there was a there were some very significant members that were engaged in this effort. Now, had you you started uh, at SIP at the very beginning, correct? Uh, actually, I started. Uh, we we had a study committee that was funded by the White House uh, as a result of President Reagan's speech. It was called the Democracy Program. And this is pre legislation. This was to develop the study and to show what the need was and to help shape the legislation. Congressman Fussell was on that committee. In fact, he led the committee, really, as was uh, Secretary Bill Brock, William Brock, a former senator, then Secretary of uh, Labor. Um, but uh, there were a number of other people on that, but Mike Samuels was on that study committee as well, as was, I believe, J yes, Jay Van Andel from Amway was also a member of that committee. So it was always sort of a given from the start that the private sector would have a key role to play in this democracy no, program, or was that something? Debated. Yeah, that's. I was. I'd love to hear about that. I mean, what? How did that come about? That 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 debate took place, and then, that people were convinced. Yes, the private sector has a key role to play here. Well, as I said, the article that uh, Mike Samuels did, along with Bill Douglas, really laid the the groundwork for it. But during the course of the study group. Uh, they, they decided they needed to reach out to the U.S. Chamber to get the business community support so it would be truly not only bipartisan, but would have business and labor behind the idea as well. But it was still a debate within the study group and among some members as to whether business really has a role to play in democratic development. And there were those at the time that said, well, look, Taiwan, South Korea, Thailand, Chile, these countries are not democracies, but they're great free enterprise systems. And we have countries that are semi-socialist, like Yugoslavia, that is uh, not that is becoming democratic, but it's not a free market. And of course, that sounds very funny to today's ears, because all of those countries, Chile, Taiwan, and so on, South Korea, are vibrant, market-oriented democracies today. And of course, we know what happened with Yugoslavia. It couldn't sustain that model. But at the time, it was a debate. And um, I'd say probably the defining moment of the debate was when Lane Kirkland, the head of the AFL-CIO, slammed his fist on the table and said, of course there's a role for free enterprise for a business community. Without a market economy and a free enterprise system, you cannot have a free labor system. So of course it has to be done. Which is a big part of SIPE's mission. It is SIPE's mission. Absolutely. Now, you moved from the, the chamber over to SIPE. What was your first job at SIPE? I was a special assistant to Samuels, who was the, Mike Samuels was the first executive director of SIPE. And I was also director of public and congressional affairs. What were the first programs? Well, one of the first programs was a, a program in Togo, in Africa where the African Union was coming together to debate whether or not they needed to have a free enterprise system or whether they needed to do economic reform. And uh, Mike Samuels went and gave a very good speech at that 
uh, at that event. But the earliest programs of SIPE were to help set up business associations, to create something. And let's go back to President Reagan's speech. Mm -hmm. when, when the National Endowment was signed, President Reagan gave a speech at the White House. It was signed in the Indian Treaty Room. And in that speech, he talked about the need to build the infrastructure of democracy. So he was looking at the chamber and SIPE to take the message of how you run a business association network internationally. So our first programs were to take training programs on how do you run, how do you build, how do you develop uh, business associations. And we took those to different countries. Uh, some of the first ones, there's one in now in Central America that's still ongoing. SIPE doesn't support it any longer, but it created it at INCAI. It's a management school that was originally started by Harvard in Costa Rica. But that program was helping to train business association leaders from different countries in Latin America. Did the same thing in a number of other countries. One of the early uh, programs that SIPE did was uh, to bring over a group of people from India and South Asia to look at the uh, way in which associations work in the U.S. They went back and to this day they still have programs like that in India, Pakistan, Nepal, and so on. So that's really where the framework of the partnership model really started. And that's yes. really one of the strengths of, of SITE. Can you kind of walk us through how that's kind of evolved through the years? Well, the beginning of it was one of the first things that uh, Ambassador Samuels and I did was to bring together a group of American chambers. All uh, Many people know this, but most countries around the world, there's an American Chamber of Commerce. These are companies that are invested in the country. What they we come call together. AmCHAMs. We call them AmCHAMs. And there was a group of them called ACLA, the Association of American Chambers of Latin America, meeting in Washington. So we had a meeting with them to present the idea of SIPE. And they said, it is very important that you realize that you're going to have to find national champions in the country. People do, are you know, just not ready to have people from the United States come and give them lectures on the importance of democracy. You need to find national champions. And we took that message very much to heart. And in fact, one of our first partners was Hernando de Soto, the gentleman that wrote The uh, Mystery of Capital, who was running a think tank in Peru. But we found partners in many other countries across the region of Latin America. Latin America at that time was going through its transition to democracy. This was in the early 80s. Another country that was very important in our early stage was the Philippines, where we worked extensively. So let's fast forward a little bit. Almost a decade later, and the Soviet Union collapses. So what happens to the whole structure of, of the National Endowment in the four core institutes? How did it change at that time? Well, it changed in a couple of ways. Um, there's several different dimensions, and I'll try to give you just a capsule summary. The first dimension was the Congress realized that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a pivotal event. And so they were saying, okay, and it was a big debate in Congress because some members said, well, look, we've won, it's over. We don't need this anymore. But then as we saw what happened in Eastern Europe and more importantly in Russia, the members began to realize that, no, we need it even more than ever not to oppose communism, but to help build, build, the democracies. Um, build the democracies and the market economies. So that was one way it changed, was it, it changed the focus a little bit. But then secondly, uh, another major initiative that we realized needed to be done was to con show people who were these people in the countries of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union who had um, wanted to get into the enterprise system. So we had a conference in, at the uh, U.S. Chamber headquarters called Who is the Russian Entrepreneur? and brought a whole group of uh, business leaders, one, of, one group of which came from what had been the Soviet Chamber. The Soviet Chamber of Commerce collapsed and it had to be rebuilt. And that was one of our big programs in Russia, was helping to build the Russian Chamber of Commerce network, the local chambers across Russia, but also supporting the national chamber in Russia in Moscow. And in fact, we helped to start a Institute for Organization Management, one of those training programs that I talked about. So that, that was one change. How difficult was that, though? I mean, it was very easy. Really? It was. It was amazingly easy. Because People were very receptive. Well, here's what happened. And this is where I became very, very convinced of the power of public diplomacy. And John, at that time, had you become executive director by that time? No, I was but still the... I was still the uh, 
the special assistant. Special assistant. In, right. In I became Falcons. executive director in 93. 93. So it was a couple yeah. years after that. A couple so, years after. Yeah. But what happened was um, we were traveling around in Russia and talking to the Russian chambers and so on. And we're very resistant. They said, look, that may be true of the United States, but that's not how things work here. That's what I was expecting you would have and heard. So, and, and we heard that over and over. So we said, okay, let's do a study tour. So we identified the people that were trying to form these local chambers along with the headquarters, the national chamber, and took them on a study tour of different local chambers in the United States. And they came away from that experience transformed. They said, okay, now we see what you mean. Now we understand why we have to do this. And I became convinced that what you need to really get these messages across is to bring people so that they can see for themselves how these systems work. And as a result of that, uh, we formed a very, very close relationship with the Russian Chamber of Commerce. And that kind of exists really today. I mean, obviously, you have a lot of, lot of different changes and problems over there. But, uh, right. But, that, uh, but we've always held that uh, relationship with that chamber. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, did you use that model of bringing people over and studying the way that we do things here as, as kind of a cornerstone of what SIPE does through the years? In the early days, it was much more. Uh, now, with the spread of the Internet, communication systems, uh, it's less necessary. But we still do have occasions when we'll bring people. When, when Sipe, um, as you know, I'm retired, so I can't keep saying we because it's a recent event. Well, it always will You're be. You're still me. part of the family here. <laughs> okay. But in any case, uh, it's not quite as vital to do it because there's so much more exposure now. But when, you're, when you go to a, a country where you have a complete transition, as, for example, uh, we saw in the collapse of the Soviet Union or, and Ukraine and all of those countries. It, it's very important to, to take that step, to bring people and expose them to the way in which not just the U.S., but Britain, uh, South Africa, other countries work. So the early model focused very much on business associations and building the capacity of business associations. Right. And then how did things spread into other areas as well? Well, an example of how it spread into other areas was in 1989. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be traveling in Eastern Europe with uh, some professors from uh, Fordham University. And we were in Hungary and Poland and the Czech Republic, then known as Czechoslovakia. And we were meeting with the leaders of the transitions and became aware of the fact that they intended to privatize their companies. And it just hit us like a, like a bolt out of the blue. If you privatize these companies, who's going to run them? No one there had experience with running a for-profit private corporation. They're all bureaucrats. They were Soviet bureaucrats. Yeah. And so we said, okay, well, we're going to have to develop some expertise in corporate governance. And so we started that really based, even before the, the big spread of corporate governance in the U.S., we started a, um, a, a program, it was actually a course taught in Hungary and, and the Czech Republic, but then it spread to all over Eastern Europe. And we realized that this was very important in other transition economies as well. Whether you're talking about Eastern Europe or the Middle East, you've got to have this ability to run corporations and in fact, later, James Wolfenson, who was the head of the World Bank, said the governance of the corporate sector is important for democracy as the governance of the government. So what, if you were to name one or two of the biggest success stories out of that first decade that you were with Site, what would that be? Well, I think getting the Russian chamber put together was a huge one. But also in the Philippines, we uh, had a great deal of success working with some private think tanks and with the Makati Business Club. And the Philippines has had a rough transition. It took a long time, but they really have become one of the leading countries in, in Asia right now. And it's, it's great to see that success story. And then, of course, in Chile, the triumph of the campaign for the no and the, re and the birth of democracy in that country was extremely important. SIP also focuses on regulatory reform and, and what needs to be in place for businesses to be successful. Did that start when you met Hernando de Soto, you know, realizing how important the sort of structure was for, for business in a country? Absolutely. Hernando was one of the first people we worked with. That was in 1984. And Hernando introduced us. I had known about it, but I didn't know the people. He introduced us to something called the New Institutional Economics, which is a branch of economics that says, look, Everything we know about economics and we talk about with the classical economic system works really well in the developed countries. 
But when you go outside of the developed countries, the rule of law isn't there, the institutional structures, private property isn't there. And Hernando was really uh, a pioneer in that. And we started working with Hernando because what he said and what he was trying to promote really made a lot of sense to us. And so we, through him, we met uh, a gentleman named Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work in the new institutional economics, and a whole group of other people that, that are affiliated with North, uh, Oliver Williamson, Ronald Coase, and others. And through that experience and working with them, uh, we became very involved with Hernando, but with other approaches as well that look at regulatory reform, uh, anti-corruption, rule of law. These are vital. In the informal sector. The informal sector. Which, which I want to talk about just a little bit because I know that's very near and dear to your heart too. Absolutely. Yeah. So well, let's just talk about that now. Uh, when, when did you two start to work on, on that in the informal sector and how important and vital that is? It was 1984. Okay. You know, that you was went one way our, back. Okay. That was start. one of our first one of the programs. First, yeah. Yeah. We uh, put together a project with Hernando, uh, who was running, as I said, this institute called the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, Instituto Libertad y Democracia, uh, in Peru. And what he had done was fascinating. He was raised, actually, in Switzerland, because his father was a, was a Peruvian ambassador to Switzerland. So Hernando was raised there and had worked in the Swiss market economy and understood that very well, but decided to go back to Peru after having gotten his master's degree from uh, an important Swiss university and working at uh, some companies that were involved with, the, with uh, international trade and the general agreement on trade and, and preferences and so forth. But he went back to Peru, and when he got there, he realized that most of the people were working in the street, were selling things. They were outside of the market economy. They weren't being taxed. They weren't paying taxes. And they weren't protected. They didn't have any property rights. Right. They didn't have any business licenses. So he asked a very simple question. Why? Why do people work this way? And that question is something we adopted and made a cornerstone of the site approach. The first question you ask, you should ask about any situation, is why do things work the way they do? And Hernando, what he did was got some graduate students and uh, a few lawyers, and they went out and tried to simulate getting a business license as if they were from that lower middle income group. In other words, not the privileged elite who could pick up the phone and call their uncle had or their the cousin. Had the contacts, mm -hmm. right. Exactly, and get through the system, but as if they were somebody from this lower middle class. And it took him, working with this group, 289 days to get a business license. Goodness. And of course, it, you know, the expense of that was equivalent to the um, per capita GDP. So it would be a year's worth of income. So in other words, next impossible to get it. Impossible. It, it would really be impossible for somebody to get through the system. And then the second question is, why would they want to? Because they got very few services. And even if they did get the property right or the business license, it wasn't very well protected. So you're spending a lot of money and a lot of effort to get something that isn't worth very much. So he realized that, you know, you really needed to transform the system of property rights, business regulation. And we worked with Hernando and with others who came to see the same reality. One of our important international conferences we held at uh, the chamber, I believe it was in 1989, on the informal sector, and had representatives from 35 countries there. Hernando gave a, a brilliant presentation, as did people from the Philippines, from India, from a variety of countries, demonstrating that this was a worldwide phenomenon, that up to 60% of the workforce in most developing countries and as much as 30% of the GDP is completely off the books. Which leads me to my next question for you, and this really is the cornerstone of SIPE, it is building those democratic institutions that, that gives those people in the, in, the, in the informal sector a chance to really be in, in the formal economy and build, build an economy, protection for entrepreneurs. T tell us how that kind of evolved with SIPE too, the, the building of the democratic institutions, the governance structures that's so important to this organization. Well, we realized that, okay, Doug North and his colleagues, uh, and it's all very well documented. In fact, you can see a brilliant lecture by Doug on the SIPE website at something called the Development Institute. You just type in developmentinstitute.org and it'll take you right there. And you can hear Doug explain uh, 
the logic of the of the new institutional economics and why property rights and rule of law are so important. But what we did was start to say, okay, how do you go about the business of creating this? And we realized that there was a fundamental flaw in the way in which development assistance was being done by most people. And this is the same thing that Hernando found, that William Easterly, who's a famous economist up in, uh, in New York, and others have discovered, and that is you can't import this stuff. You've got to base it on domestic issues. And so we looked for, and again, that takes me back to what those people from the AmCham's told us, in every country we look for a champion, someone who can analyze the existing structures and the existing issues and say, okay, where are the problems? And more importantly, can help identify people that can work on that, that want to change it, that have an idea of how you can create a better system. So we work with local partners who understand what's going on on the ground, why things are working the way they are and what needs to change. Right. What does site bring to the equation? What does site bring to help them make the changes that they need to make? Well, number one is analyzing the existing situation because most of them, of course, wouldn't have heard of the new institutional economics. And we don't come in with lectures on economics. We come in with very simple methodologies. One, in fact, that's borrowed from uh, the U.S. Chamber. It's called the National Business Agenda. And it's a very interesting methodology. We've used it all over the world. You don't bring in a solution. You bring in an approach. And the approach is you hold meetings, focus group meetings of small business people, medium business people, large business people, and hopefully people in the informal sector to identify what are the barriers facing the firm? What are the issues that the firm faces? What are the most important issues and how do you solve them? So in some countries that'll be property rights, in other countries it'll be taxes, other countries it'll be this issue of getting business registration, and then you put together an agenda and you mobilize and, and start advocating for that. And here's again where we can come in because we can help train people and show them what are the tools of public policy advocacy. How do you mobilize a group of people to participate in an effort to create reform? And how do you build a coalition? How do you build a coalition? John, now we're in 2016, and it seems like the world has almost come full circle since the fall of the Soviet Union. We saw the expansion of democracies all over the world, but now we're seeing a pushback on democracy and a pushback literally on the private sector in places like Russia, China, Venezuela, and other places. What do you think SIPE's uh, leadership role should be uh, in, this, in this new uh, era? Well, there's really two major factors. So let me talk about the first factor, which is that this authoritarian pushback, as, we, as it's called, or the, or the democratic recession is another term that's being used for it is something that's real. And in fact, uh, there's a great uh, journal called the Journal of Democracy, which is put out by the National Endowment, which has been studying this, and they put out some great articles. One of the best is from a gentleman named Larry Diamond, and you've had him on your uh, shows here, and I believe you have a interview with Larry. Mm, yeah, we have a video of him. We have a video of him on our, yeah. on our website. On our so you YouTube, can, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's you really go, good. You can go there and look And you're in that video it. too, I believe. Right, I interviewed him. <laughs> But uh, what Larry did that was so brilliant is there's something called the Freedom House Indicators, which look at political rights and civil liberties. And that's what makes up, in the traditional view, democracy. And so he was looking at the decline in those values and where it was being pushed back. But what he did was he split it into three groups. So instead of just political rights and civil liberties, he also created a law and governance dimension. And what he discovered was that most of the recession, the democratic recession, was in this area of law and governance. So what we're finding is that in countries where you see a democratic recession, where you're seeing democracy being weakened, it's because the rule of law is being weakened. And the issue of uh, governance, the governance systems are not performing adequately. And that's really what SIPE works on so much. This national business agenda is a ex perfect example, as, in our, as is Hernando's work on the informal sector. It's the law, regulation, improving the functioning, and creating the democratic feedback to advocate for reform that becomes so important. And what we're seeing now more than ever is that SIPE, in this area of democracy building, SIPE's emphasis on the democratic governance as opposed to simply leadership selection and elections, but looking at what happens between elections becomes absolutely vital.
And do you see a broad um, acceptance of, of that as being important, or is that something that you think is still sort of a message we need to get out? It's a message that you have to continuously get out. And it's one in which, you know, people will always say, it's not just elections that we need to worry about. We need to look at what happens between elections. But then they proceed mainly to focus on the elections. Right. So this is a message that needs to continuously get out. Well, the authoritarians are being very aggressive on the other way because uh, in China, Russia, Venezuela, there's NGO laws now right. that, that are coming Well, about. the authoritarians have figured out that it's those NGOs and the civil society that's working between elections that are advocating for reform, that those are the ones that they want to really suppress, that they want to control most, because that's the origin of where you get democratic transformation. And it has a huge impact on entrepreneurs because they're protecting the oligarchs in their country. You, know, right. you have kleptocracies, uh, especially in Russia. So it's, the work we do here at, at SIP is vitally important to protect that Well, sector. and that's the other dimension. I mentioned one was the law and governance mm -hmm. dimension. The other dimension is that there is an assumption that if you have private enterprise, that means you have a market economy. And we've worked continuously over the years to demonstrate that that is not the same thing. You could have a lot of private enterprise, as in the Philippines under President Marcos. He was, they were the ones that discovered the term crony capitalism, by the way. Uh, that was first used in the Philippines, and it was a brilliant the definition of their system. And in fact, one of, the, one of the people that we've worked with over the years is a guy named Robert Lighton, who together with Carl Schramm and some others wrote a book called Good Capitalism, Bad Capitalism. And in that book, he separate, they separate out different forms of capitalism, different, only one of which is the market economy. So just because they have wealthy business people in a country like Russia or uh, Peru or any other country, they can be oligarchs. They're still private entrepreneurs, but they're oligarchs. They're connected. And it's that area of the crony capitalism that you really need to focus on is the correlation, correlate to this issue of law and governance. If you don't have a real open entrepreneurial system, it's very difficult to develop uh, democratic governance and rule of law. John, you've been here since the beginning, uh, and you're a longtime executive director. What in your opinion, is your biggest personal accomplishment that you have done here at SIPE? Building a team. Uh, this is not a one-person show, and I'll give you a good example of that. We were putting on a conference in Egypt in uh, a number of years ago. I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. And at that conference, we were introducing the idea, it was the late 90s, actually, and we were introducing this idea of corporate governance, which we had to worked on so much in Eastern Europe, but we realized it was hardly known in the Middle East. So we held a conference in Cairo, and during the conference, some of the conference participants leaned over to me and said, John, unless the people in the audience speak English, they can't understand what you're talking about. We had a speaker from the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, talking about the governance, international corporate governance principles. And I said, well, what do you mean? Because We've hired the best translators in Egypt. They were very expensive. I said, well, I understand that. But the problem is, there's no word for governance in Arabic. And that just hit us like a bolt out of the blue. If you can't say it, how can you do it? So we worked with the Arab Bankers uh, Association, the Private Equity Association, and others, as well as the Arab Linguistics uh, Institute and the Arab League, and it took almost two years to come up with a term. But that term is now in existence and it's spreading throughout the And what release. is that term? Halkama. Halkama. And Halkama is governance, and corporate governance becomes Halkama Asharikat. And does that have a root? What, where does that come from? It comes from the Quran. Mm -hmm. Because in modern standard Arabic and in the language that there are a lot of dialects, but the language that covers the region as a whole, every word has to have a Quranic root, which is why you had to have. Uh, religious scholars involved in putting together this together. work. And, and you built a very big team at SIPE. Really, John, I mean, when you started, how many were you were here on your first day? A couple of you? Two or three? Uh, one. One. And then uh, and shortly and after now that, there's shortly 60 after or so here in, here, in here in Washington. 60 or so, yeah, maybe 30 overseas. I mean, we're worldwide. looking at 1995. Yeah. 
Right. 100. Yeah, so it turned into it, you, great you accomplishment. Have a, lot, a lot to be proud of because you've really built up a world class organization. Well, here. And, and we also think of our partners as part of the team. Of course. And there's probably five or six hundred of them in different countries around the world. So overall, it's more like seven or eight hundred. John, thanks so much for coming by today. This is a real pleasure for us. It's been fantastic. And it's like a, a walk in time because it's really interesting for us, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. Because you learn something every, every time someone comes in here that we d didn't know before. And That's it, right. It's a lot of fun. We really enjoy it. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Okay. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at sipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>